but thank you so much, Clara, for uh, this introduction and for the invitation. And thank you to all the attendees for uh, taking some time out of your afternoon for this talk. So I think it, it's productive, actually, to start with why I wrote the book in the first place, actually. Sometimes it's a question that comes up in question and answer, sometimes not. But because we already started to digress a bit into my research, uh, it's good to open up that field of, of inquiry, I think, and clarification. So I've always been interested, of course, in the climate question for at least over a decade, and certainly environmental development issues as they affect the global north uh, since childhood. Uh, so what, what struck me with the way the, the Green New Deal debate immediately unfurled uh, in, the, in the global north, especially the, the debate as it unfurled in the United States, was that it was extremely hard to build analytical, political, uh, theoretical, human, humanistic bridges between the type of work that I'm doing for, in terms of my scholarly intellectual projects and the political discussion, uh, which was also of course an academic, intellectual, scholarly and planning discussion about how to formulate a Green New Deal uh, in the United States and soon a Green New Deal in Europe and uh, other global North countries, right? Because uh, the, first of all, the problems that different countries face are of course, very different. Uh, the challenges they face are very different. Uh, and therefore the ways that people can act politically within their countries are going to be very different. And what, uh, what perturbed me a bit were, were two things. One of them was other people were not perturbed. So I was like, okay, we need to think collectively, actively together to think about how to bridge uh, the desire for a humane, ecologically sound, sustainable, popular, uh, working class oriented development policy in the North with the needs in the South, right? It's, that seemed, uh, it, it seemed clear to me. I'm certainly not capable of carrying out such a task independently. It must be collective like any good scholarly endeavor. So how are we gonna accomplish it, right? That was one uh, aspect or one challenge or one contradiction. The other aspect was, of course, uh, that, that stemmed more from my own viewpoint, but also from my intellectual work around national liberation and the troubles of post-colonial planning uh, under, under conditions of kind of peripheral underdevelopment. And then uh, the ideas and inspirations uh, that came from heterodox intellectual traditions, like how could those enter the Green New Deal discussion, right? And some people might say that it's not very important that they enter the Green New Deal discussion. But of course, it depends what, uh, what, what kind of world you want to see, right? There's no way of escaping the normative implications of the models we put forward, right? Because they uh, reflect, of course, a normative predisposition to the world we live in. And they also reflect a uh, normative predisposition to the world we want to see. So. Of course, uh, I have specific ideas about that, which I'm going to unroll in the, in the course of the presentation. But I thought it's good, uh, you know, to say, okay, if people are un, not only uninterested but unwilling and to share this project of thinking, okay, how can we bridge the struggles from different places and the planning procedures and the ways of analyzing and thinking of ecological and social contradiction from different socio-spatial locations? Then, if people aren't interested in that project, then maybe we're having different normative ambitions as well, and that's important to clarify. Just because it clarifies, okay, it's, it's okay to have different normative ambitions. It's the nature of the world we live in uh, as uh, social, political, intellectual creatures. But it's important to be clear about that. Right? Um, so this came to to the Green New Deal. Now, I actually think uh, there tends to be a normalization, especially in discussions like these, uh, who amongst people who agree that there is. Uh, okay. Um, um, <laughs> amongst people who agree that there is a huge ecological and climate crisis, to say, okay, it's only normal that we should be talking resolutions to the crisis. And I want to say that I think that uh, that might slide over some issues about why we're discussing a Green New Deal that while not necessarily central to uh, how the Green New Deal deals themselves are envisioned, help us at least contextualize the discussion, right? Because we know that ideas are coming from somewhere uh, because people are inserted into the world, right? And ideas, uh, the, the, we know that as a kind of basic methodological point, but we also know that because we know that the climate crisis has been very real, very apparent to uh, an educated 
liberal to radical public in the US for at least 25 years, right? I mean, it's been very well known that there are too much carbon dioxide molecules going out into the atmosphere. Uh, and this is going to cause a catastrophe for what there is of human civilization, not only in the weaker parts of the world, the more underdeveloped parts of the world, but also in the, what is called the developed world, right? This has been very well known by progressive minded people or people who are looking clearly at the science. Yet there has been a complete inability to get any sort of policy discussion about that uh, in the public sphere, right? I think this is important to keep in mind that we shouldn't necessarily naturalize the discussion. You have to think why, why did the discussion emerge, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm not in the minds necessarily of the people who are involved in formulating uh, these proposals, but I have some hypotheses. I mean, I think one of the hypotheses is that we are in, since 2008, uh, neoliberalism or even capitalism, not necessarily as modes of structuring the political economy of the US or the world system, but actually as ideologically legitimated modes of rule are not, uh, are suffering a legitimacy crisis, right? Um, even in 2008, you saw, I think, uh, York political economist Marxist, I think it was Leo Panitch in, in foreign policy, writing about the return of Marx, right? And of course the widespread uh, uh, appeal and circulation of someone like Thomas Piketty, for example. I mean, this reflects, uh, shattering, if not evaporation, of the legitimacy of the system as it is today, right? So when a system loses legitimacy, there are attempts to either re-legitimate it, to replace it, uh, to reform it, and so forth, right? So suddenly you have an opening for policy alternatives that was not open before. That's part of it. Another portion, um, we can mute this chat, I don't know. Um, uh, and um, the, the other aspect, I think, is that uh, how, however one orients to the rise of China, which is something I consider totally irrelevant from the perspective of uh, I'm putting forward in the book, the rise of China is a clear challenge to the U.S. Uh, dominion over the world economic system, right? This is something uh, openly being discussed, again, in U.S. policy circles, right? Um, it's not just the rise of China, though, right? And it's not just the endogenization of value. It's not just the endogenization of technology. I think there's a specific aspect linked to shifts in uh, the, the onset of uh, kind of a looming Chinese capacity to overtake uh, the U.S. in terms of a renewable capacity, right? And who will have the lead in terms of the technology to oversee a shift to a different industrial system based on a different sort of technology. Right? I think that's a very important element also that isn't always introduced into these conversations. Um, and so into this mix, into this uh, crisis of legitimization, right? this is where we can place the onset of this discussion from uh, Ocasio-Cortez right? and her Green New Deal, which I assume everybody on this call has at least uh, passing familiarity or at least familiarity with the name. Now, what did this come from, right? This came from a certain sector of the Democratic Party that's putting forward a distinct policy alternative that's saying, okay, this is how we want to reconstitute uh, the political economy of the United States, its relations to the world, its industrial plan, and so forth, right? Um, including a variety of uh, policy options and also not things which are not necessarily policy, but have more to appealing to a distinct set of constituencies, right? It was a way of orienting to that that came from uh, the political grouping called the Justice Democrats. And so they put forward this proposal. And suddenly, of course, whenever someone introduces a proposal, other forces uh, have to react to it, right? This is also natural. So what do we see in front of us? In my view, we see actually uh, four, four distinct proposals or four distinct options uh, for dealing with the climate crisis that are coalescing in front of us. And of course, it's a kind of uh, ideal typical typology things are uh, blurring into one another at the margins and so forth. And the, the substance of those is what I'm going to discuss. And then I'm going to elaborate much more on the, my own proposal. Um, so the first one is uh, a fairly um, uh, conservative proposal that uh, seeks basically to continue uh, the existing system, but in a modified form with a new technological suite. Um, what I call an elite great transition in the book. 
the second option is uh, the left liberal proposal, which is also a very wide span, and you can say more or less from uh, certain aspects of the Biden climate plan to uh, what Ocasio-Cortez was bringing. Then we see a social democratic plan, which is a very wide range of options, ranging from uh, what you kind of regularly see being promulgated by promulgated in, in Jacobin, which is co coming out in uh, some of the UN uh, Conference on Trade uh, and Development, uh, some of which has come out from aspects of the European New Deal, aspects of um, uh, some of it is coming from uh, the, the Paul and Chomsky wing, aspects of it uh, are in Anne Pettifor's work, aspects of it are in Naomi Klein's work. So this is a, a very wide range of plans for a social democratic reconstruction of the U.S. and European uh, social, ecological, economic systems. Then, uh, of course, there is a, a more uh, structural proposal for more structural changes in the world economic system, uh, which is what I've put forward, but is also uh, following generally uh, following generally what um, what the Red Nation, for example, and the indigenous group in the United States, what Cooperation Jackson has been doing um, down in the American South. Uh, it uh, dovetails, I think, with some of the calls for Appalachian New Deals that uh, have actually been in the air for a very long time and haven't uh, achieved any sort of uh, policy impact for a variety of reasons, which I'm happy to go into in the, in the Q&A. Um, and with aspects of the European degrowth movement and also the US degrowth movement with um, DSA, with people who consider themselves eco-socialists and so forth. So I think there's a, a wide range of proposals uh, emphasizing different things, but uh, emphasizing furthermore that we need to uh, have a problem that uh, attacks, uh, we need a solution that attacks the problem at the root, first of all, and that also does not restrict itself to looking at a reconstruction of the United States and Europe, but also looks more broadly to uh, uh, extra national horizons that also looks uh, towards uh, the global south, towards Latin America, towards Africa, towards Asia, and also looks towards uh, the indigenous nations living in places like uh, the modern day Canada and the United States. So what are the content of each of these proposals? The first proposal is uh, associated openly with uh, groups like Storderland Foundation, Breakthrough Institute, World Economic Forum, um, and um, you can see it kind of in uh, some of Jeremy Rifkin's work, um, the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, which is associated with uh, Bloomberg, uh, Macquarie, um, uh, initiative of, uh, of uh, the former UN Secretary General and so forth. What are, what are these proposals uh, and the Breakthrough Institute also in Australia, what do these proposals have in common? And what are they talking about? And also what are they not talking about? What they have in common more or less is a plan to basically do what uh, Daniela Gabor calls uh, crowd finance in. So in other words, to bring in a great deal of idle capital that is currently sitting uh, in low interest bonds, low interest returns, crowd it in and bring it into productive investment, uh, not only in the global north, but especially in the global south through uh, infrastructural guarantees and, uh, and investment guarantees that in a sense de-sovereignize third world states. That is remove their sovereign control over these treaties and place them under the aegis of uh, international tribunals, which uh, are concomitant with, uh, with investment guarantees. Um, the, the other aspect of it, which I think is uh, very central, is the, there is a call for uh, enhanced border controls. And in, by enhanced border controls, um, uh, the, the, with uh, restricting of population movements, uh, there's actually literal calls for this in the Australian breakthrough, it's a paraphrase, um, for using the military as part of uh, forced labor uh, forms of uh, getting them involved in labor recruitment, which I think uh, some sort of euphemism, but is a preg rather pregnant euphemism. Um, there are calls for uh, extensive use of biofuels. There are calls for uh, half earth, which is gaining a lot of ground, especially uh, with the liberal biologist at Harvard, uh, E.O. Wilson, right? Half earth meaning reserving either half the earth or 30% of the earth for more or less human free or human constrained biodiversity reserves that are relying on a concept of a radical separation of humans from nature. 
um, and that also uh, do not mention a number of things, right? What are the, these plans do not mention uh, demilitarization. Uh, should, um, they, uh, they do not mention uh, demilitarization, they do not mention uh, climate debt, uh, and they don't particularly mention any of the developmental needs of uh, the third world. They don't really have an ambition towards world developmental convergence or per capita resource energy use convergence. These aspects are essentially absent. What are, so that's kind of the, what I consider the, the elite great transition then there are uh, another set of proposals uh, that more or less come from uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Biden, and so forth. And again, this is a, um, it's a very loose camp precisely because uh, they aren't ex exactly getting a lot of policy traction. But one, of, one aspect is it, it, it's having a great similarity to the first camp, but there's much more of an emphasis on reindustrialization of the United States. So when they're talking about reindustrialization of the United States, first they're talking about something like an Apollo project or uh, the metaphor of, of course, the New Deal for uh, the reconstruction of the US industrial plant and a lot of American jobs. Now that could also come with things like carbon tariffs, meaning uh, that the way, the process of, of reindustrialization is how industrialization has historically occurred, right? It's through uh, protection of infant industries through tariff protection. Um, they're also, uh, widespread calls within this camp for attention to uh, racism, but often not with extensive calls for social redistribution, but rather in their stead calls for, in one way or another, enfolding um, the constituency uh, of uh, various minorities and diversity uh, uh, minorities in the U.S. into some form of kind of clientelist uh, racial liberalism, which is uh, the term that came out of the Ford Foundation in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, now, again, these programs, just like the first set of programs, are more or less silent on uh, the third world. They do not, are, are silent on the U.S. military, which is uh, one of the 50 largest pollu uh, carbon dioxide emitters in the, in the world. They uh, systematically do not mention agriculture. They systematically do not mention climate debt, um, which is very significant. And although I'm only going to get to it in the, fourth, in the third section. Um, so there's a lot of silences in these proposals. So this includes Ocasio-Cortez, right? Who, where, and there are also uh, things that are not silent but are not being discussed, for example. This is actually a plan, much like the New Deal, to, fund, to direct uh, state money to uh, private corporations, right? That is in the legislation with appropriate ownership states, uh, rather opaque for the public. And none of this, th these types of programs or initiatives or uh, planks did not really make their way into the, uh, the Biden climate legislation. That's kind of the second plank. The third plank is, I think, the most capacious, ambiguous, um, in some ways opaque at its borders, uh, nebulous. And that is the, the plans for social democratic reconstruction. So here, these plans call for very, very extensive shifts in wealth, redistrib wealth distribution in the United States. And uh, by implication, of course, uh, Europe, because it's it's rather difficult, I think, to imagine that you would have this type of uh, social democratic change in one without having social democratic change in the other, especially given that uh, Europe is historically warmer to social democracy and such uh, redistributions of wealth than the U.S. So it's calling for very substantial to the point where the, the far left end of these social democratic proposals envision an eventual transformation uh, out, of, uh, out of capitalism after what, for example, some of them call a less stimulus, a less Keynesian uh, stimulus to uh, carry out the transformation to fossil fuels. In contrast to the, the first two programs, these types of programs do tend to put a hard cap, a uh, temporal cap on fossil fuel emissions, claiming that we need to get to net zero in the US by 2030, uh, which is, I think, an initiative I support in spirit and even in letter, uh, very difficult to get to in the current state of things, right? It's very clear uh, based on what happened, what just happened at the last climate accords, right? Um, these also call uh, have uh, a varying uh, gam a varying range of relationships to both the racial history of the United States and the colonial history of the United States. So they often are calling explicitly for uh, the decolonization or attention to the settler colonial nature of the United States. This is again Naomi Klein, a planet to win, and so forth. And it's also uh, it's also in the Ocasio Cortez Green New Deal. What what that means, of course. Uh, its programmatic content 
is less clear. I mean, it's, uh, it's clear that you can't very well call for the continuance of uh, kind of the, the current uh, social, demo, uh, a future call for a social democratic republic of the United States and also call for its decolonization. These goals are fundamentally at odds uh, with whatever programmatic uh, content one wants to fill decolonization. Okay, so what else? They also call for a full shift to therefore, because it's net zero, full shift to renewables, a huge amount of attention to issues of social reproduction, adequate compensation for the labor of social reproduction. So there's a lot of lessons drawn from feminist economics. Um, and there's a lot of call for uh, rebuilding of social infrastructure, green spaces, greening of cities, public infrastructure, decommodified public infrastructure, uh, rebuilding of schools to make them net zero and also make them beautiful, rebuilding or uh, building at all of Amtrak subway lines and so forth. Um, they also have a kind of nebulous call for a supply chain often, or at least sometimes a call for a supply chain internationalism, um, meaning some sort of attention to the fact that the resources for uh, transmit, uh, transformation of the domestic energy system don't come from somewhere. They come from somewhere, right? Overwhelmingly, a lot of them are coming from Democratic Republic of Congo for cobalt. There are uh, for lithium, they're coming from uh, Bolivia, Chile, and so forth. So there's uh, issues related to that. It's actually, uh, there's very work, good work being done by Alex Dunlap on this and other people. Um, and it's going to be a very important uh, issue of contestation going forward. Right, there's that. Um, the silences. The silences are first, um, there is, uh, and I should say, I forgot that they are also calling generally for the worldwide shuttering of the uh, petroleum industry, which is actually uh, much more complicated than it seems at first, um, because they're actually distributional effects. There are distributional effects if you shutter the petroleum industry in uh, third world petroleum dependent countries. Uh, someone could mute, please. Maybe yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to find one second. Yeah, okay, no, no, no problem. Just wanted to make sure. Um, uh, so then I think the, the silences that need more speaking are one, there isn't a call for comprehensive demilitarization. Now, if you want to shift a huge amount of U.S. industrial production to something else, even from a logistical level, bracketing uh, internationalist moral concerns and so forth, or what normative visions, you have to demilitarize the U.S. You just aren't going to get to 20, 30 net zero full renewable conversion unless you have a massive shift of the industrial. That's one thing. Um, and of course, there are, are much broader political concerns about demilitarization that I think are, are relevant in terms of the direction of the kind of surplus industrial capacity or the just industrial capacity of the US as a society that I think are very much need to be foregrounded in any such discussion. That's one uh, gap. The other gap is around climate though. Now it's clear that there's a financing gap between what countries in the first world and what countries in the third world are able to do. I mean, let me, the country I know best, Tunisia, is currently paying public sector employees out of low IMF loans, right? In the past, it paid for infrastructure out of IMF loans. Now it's paying its public sector wage bill from IMF loans. So where is it going to mobilize the capacity for a renewables transition without infusions of external capital, right? This is why um, there have been calls for since, you know, 2009 for uh, $100 billion a year to be ramped up rapidly uh, to go into the appropriate funds for uh, a transition. Now, um, what uh, th this contrasts with much more ambitious calls, which I'm about to discuss, because on its face, of course, 100 billion a year can seem like a lot. Uh, it's understandable until you consider that the number of people in underdeveloped countries is about 4 billion. So it's, uh, it's $25 ahead per year for a renewable transition. Then it suddenly doesn't seem like very much at all. Right? Um, now, this brings us to, to the fourth program. Now, the fourth program has a lot in common with the third program. Um, it has a common, uh, I think, calls for, and as fast as possible, be it 2030 or, or later, a transition to uh, renewables. It has in common a call for a confrontation with the fossil fuel companies. It has in, call, uh, in common uh, internationalism, attention to settler co colonialism, attention to the, issue, the U.S. history of uh, racism, calls for widespread decommodification, uh, investment in public infrastructure, investment in roads, uh, not roads, uh, railways and 
other forms of kind of collective infrastructure to actually give uh, the US population the capacity to get around in a normal manner, not using cars. Um, it also calls for the reconstitution of the US urban fabric so that uh, cities are more walkable and also so there's a lot more green space. Um, um, now, where it's distinct is uh, a number, uh, a number of a number of plants. Um, uh, both, um, and so that this is the second half of my book. Um, and so there's three sectors in this book. Um, there is a, a chapter on agriculture, a chapter more or less on urban planning uh, and industrialization um, and manufacturing, um, which in which I uh, kind of include energy. And then there's a chapter on international. So let me start by discussing uh, how I think it's helpful to rethink industrialization of planning. So of course, I think it's necessary to have these rapid transmissions in terms of, um, in terms of uh, especially transportation infrastructure, right? There's actually uh, one of the major uh, causes of uh, pollution. But I also think you need a certain amount of relocalization of economic production, right? This is not either, this is not about uh, autarky. It's not about nationalism. It's not about nativism. It's not about localism, right? It's actually just thinking, okay, moving things requires energy. So you make your, uh, if you make your productive fabric require an excess of social interchange based on moving things, whether that's nationally or internationally, right? Then energetically speaking, you're gonna require a lot of resources to do so. Now, of course, uh, issues of comparative advantage, free trade and so forth, those enter from a different perspective, but I'm speaking strictly, I mean, I don't agree with those perspectives, but strictly speaking, energetically, you're gonna have use a lot of resources just to move things around. I mean, the major traded goods are things like building materials are things like, and are actually uh, oil and uh, it's byproduct itself, right? Um, and they just weigh a lot. So if you can build using local materials, and there's no reason in principle you can't build using local materials, you're actually gonna immediately make for a more efficient uh, and effective, and I think humane and beautiful, uh, industrial manufacturing, infrastructural, urban fabric, right? So the perspective that I draw on here is basically, in a sense, updating uh, William Morris or something for the 21st century. Um, and it's saying, okay, why is it that we use a specific suite of materials? It's because the price system told us that it was rational to use this suite of materials in essence, right? Much of what is currently produced using unsustainable and long distance shipped uh, goods, um, bracketing concrete, for example, can actually be made locally using um, lumber or using any sort of vernacular building technology or updating vernacular building technology to use bamboo. And this is, uh, there, I have a lot of sources in the book that detail how exactly you can make the entire process of building up your infrastructure, your urban infrastructure, your suburban infrastructure, your peri-urban infrastructure, your rural infrastructure, but the houses that people work in, the offices that people uh, work, in, work in, to make that basically carbon negative, right? You use it by doing natural materials or by using uh, certain forms of analogs like uh, biochar infused building materials um, that are extremely strong. The engineering capacity exists to make them extremely strong but they don't require uh, carbon emissions to do so, right? So this is actually possible, but it would also require a more local orientation to production and also do very similar things with manufacturing. So one of the major things that I think is, is often lost in the discussion about accessibility to goods is that the things most people like the best, right? Um, maybe people on this call will disagree with this uh, stipulation, but I think most of the things that people like best in the world are actually things that more or less come indirectly or directly from agriculture, right? I mean, people generally, not always, but prefer things like cotton, wool, leather, uh, wood, uh, woven items, uh, reeds, and so forth, right? Um, and also that extends to physical objects, wooden furniture. This isn't always, right? I mean, of course, right? This is not meant to be a blanket statement, but in general, the things that people like the best can actually be a kind of what I call a low tech uh, form of uh, collective luxury that could be available and would actually uh, come directly from the land. Um, uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this point because it, it is actually where uh, land management and uh, manufacturing uh, come into a conversation with one another. That's one thing. Now, the, the other aspects of the industrial and energetic issues, I think, 
are one, uh, making cities actually much greener and actually thinking about how you can redesign cities to meld them into the uh, kind of uh, the natural landscape. This isn't to de cities, but to say, okay, where can you put trees in cities? Where can you put urban gardens in cities? How can you make living rooftops in cities, right? These have a lot of knock-on effects that I think are uh, under-articulated a lot in the present discourse. I mean, this is how you actually prevent flooding in cities like New York, right? I mean, oh, I know most of you, you guys are in New York. New York had major floods this summer, right? This can actually be completely prevented with adequate urban planning, using things like rainwater barrels, using things like extensive planting of uh, green spaces in places that are currently unable to absorb storm runoff water. If you do that in a comprehensive way with citywide planning, you don't really need, uh, you should uh, renew the sewage system, but you don't have to. Right? You can actually make the landscape absorb all of that flood runoff water. It's actually very efficient from a human perspective, um, from a energetic planning perspective. It's not efficient from other perspectives. The problem is getting uh, public policy on board for that type of transition. You also cool off the city and you modulate the temperature. So you spend, in fact, the more greenery you have, uh, the city is cooler in the summer, it's warmer in the winter, you spend less on cooling and you spend less on heating, which is one of the major contributors to US energy. Right? So these are ways of making life more efficient uh, from a kind of humane ecological systems perspective, right? while also, of course, putting the onus of these transformations on the state. Right? So the state takes them in hand and uses the public purse to make all of these uh, social goods actually available to the population and make them cheaper. Um, another aspect of this is the call for worldwide convergence and per capita energy use, right? Because if you have an energy budget for, say, the United States, this is uh, going to be related to a carbon emissions budget. And this, in turn, is going to be related to how much energy, uh, and this, when you tie it into the question of climate debt and climate uh, financing, this is going to be intimately related to who gets to use world energy resources, right? Because who gets to use the energy resources that are produced by the US industrial plan, if other countries can't bring it online fast enough, or if they have to use carbon uh, dense fuels in their transmission to a renewables uh, heavy system, right? This is, uh, I think the only um, humane call is for effective convergence in per capita energy use, paying attention to the fact that of course, certain places need more heating, other places need more cooling and so forth. So of course you have to pay attention to the disparities in temperature. Right? It's not about saying that everything is homogenous, everything needs to be exactly the same, but putting that as the developmental ambition, right? because per capita energy use more or less, not more or less, but is a, is a strong proxy at least for overall healthcare outcomes um, and development outcomes. So that's that aspect. The agriculture aspect is a, is a US-wide shift towards agroecological production systems. Now, uh, people, agroecological is basically mimicking the logic of traditional farming systems, that is basically the farming systems the whole world used until 1800, but actually upgrading them using uh, laboratory science, saying, okay, how can we make these more productive? How can we make them use the appropriate, uh, produce enough of the physical materials we need, keeping in mind that we actually need to get more, procure more physical materials from agriculture under a system like this, where we're systematically replacing um, industrial source products with agricultural source products. So, um, the, the first thing that people legitimately worry about, of course, is productivity and food availability. They're like, you want to go back to uh, us living in like a prelapsarian habitat where we're all going to starve to death. No, that is definitely, not only is that not on my agenda, it's not on anyone's agenda. And it's, it's very well established in the science, that, uh, in, the, in the estimates of per capita food production. The world food system produces around 6,000 calories per capita right now. Uh, it is used very inefficiently. A lot of it is lost in waste. A lot of it is lost in ethanol, for example. Um, a lot of it is used in animal feed uh, in ways that are not necessarily very efficient and so forth. So you can actually radically reduce product. We won't radically reduce productivity, but you can radically reduce productivity uh, of farming systems and still fully feed the world. So feeding the world is, is not an issue. This is a Malthusian scarecrow that we really need to try uh, to avoid and learn about why it's incorrect. That's one thing. Another aspect is uh, what will happen to yields if we shift to these fully sustainable forms of farming. As far as we know, in the global north on the whole, 
yields of the highest yielding crops, like corn, wheat, et cetera, would drop 25% if you shift to, say, fully organic or agroecological production systems. Um, in the third world as a whole, or the global periphery, yields will either remain the same or they'll increase. Now, if you take the most advanced systems of production, you actually see radical increases in yield. And again, it's fully documented, footnoted in the book. There's uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of the application of agroecological techniques in uh, Mexico, Ghana, so forth, radically increasing uh, per human hour and also per hectare productivity of uh, usable, usable agricultural products. Now, why do we want to do this, right? This is the question, right? Because um, it, Traditionally, when you when you revert to a system where you're no longer replacing uh, labor with capital, people worry that you would suddenly uh, be urging a lot of people to go back to the countryside. Now, I don't think this is true. First of all, in the U.S., it's definitely a different and it's a totally different scenario in the South. This type of production system is actually relatively productive per unit of labor. So, my estimate is that you would require around. 7% of the U.S. working population, maybe 10%, to be in one way or another involved in agriculture under such a system. Now, maybe this could be a lot less, to be frank. We actually have no idea because we don't really know how productive these systems could be if R&D in agronomic research institutions were directed towards agroecological forms of farming. Now, uh, why is this important? Right? This is maybe the most important question. Why is it important? Why, am I, why is a whole chapter in my book about this? It's important because agriculture currently uses uh, produces around 26% Estimates are between, say, 16 and 35 percent, but we now think it's really closer to 26, 27 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, right? In principle, agriculture should not be producing greenhouse gas emissions, right? This is actually a symptom of both the industrialization of agriculture and also the fact that uh, food is extensively processed, shipped, and so forth. This, in a sense, is low-hanging fruit. You can get rid of it very easily. So the shift to agroecology actually makes agriculture on the whole carbon negative. Um, this is now entering World Bank reports as um, carbon, uh, natural carbon solutions and so forth, but it also, um, I think, has a popular edge that should be, uh, we should focus on. There are estimates, for example, that if you shifted to these forms of production methods um, for the U.S., you could actually uh, eliminate, you could absorb 10% of current U.S. emissions using these methods, in addition to getting to carbon zero from the agricultural system. So this is actually very urgent. You also eliminate things like uh, the algal blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. You eliminate uh, a cancer epidemic whose etiology is actually not very well known. It's obviously linked to agriculture. You s resolve a lot of problems linked to uh, immune dysfunction, linked to uh, vitamin deficiencies, linked to obesity. They're all linked to our current food, si food system, which is actually very bad for human beings. Right? The food system is actually pathological for human beings. This is like, really well established in the literature. And it's, now, um, how do you do it? One, um, you know, this isn't often discussed, but Bill Gates is now buying up a huge amount of the farmland in the United States. You need to carry out a world, uh, US-wide agrarian reform in order to shift the production structure of the US farming system. Uh, at some point, you need to have parity prices so that people on farms can receive adequate wages for their work. Um, and whether this includes the migrant workforce uh, getting uh, living, fully living wages or whether the agrarian reform means that that sector of the population owns land to be determined, right? But it's something we have to think about seriously. I mean, there is actually a very large agricultural population in the United States if you include the migrant labor or agricultural population. It's, just that it's often not included in these statistics. Um, so you have a lot of ecological, you, and needless to say, the biodiversity benefits for this kind of structural transformation are absolutely enormous, right? You actually basically turn farms into places that uh, are homes for insects, uh, animals to move across and so forth. And this actually turns uh, the whole agricultural landscape of the U.S. Um, and other countries, too, which are also... Uh, it's desperate that they adopt agroecological methods. It turns them into these kind of in-between zones between what are called kind of wild wilderness, although I think it's a misleading term, um, and uh, cities, say. And so it allows for animal migration. So actually you have a lot, you basically really uh, put a, a roadblock in the ongoing process of mass extinction, right? Which we actually are starting to read about regularly, right? We read about bird die-offs, we read about bee die-offs, read about insect die-offs, right? This is actually the unraveling of the of the trophic web in um, the United States and more broadly, and it's actually extremely dangerous, right? And it's something we want to uh, 
actively resist. Um, the other aspect of it is that uh, once you do this, you actually tie human beings into landscape management, right? So this is actually ties to this question of where do we get manufactured goods from? We actually get it from landscape management, um, including wood, bamboo, and so forth. So um, this, uh, I'm going on for quite a while. Uh, this brings me to the last chapter, which is about internationalism. So how do we tie this to the international uh, order? How do we tie this to the periphery? How do we tie this to developmental needs in the global South, right? Rather than sidestepping it, which is pretty much uh, the default in most of these plans. Now, of course, it's, it's this question of um, reducing the emissions of the US is of course beneficial for most of humanity. This is for sure. But there's also other aspects, right? Demil so this is where demilitarization comes in. If you eliminate the military, I don't think the military is carrying out things that are productive in terms of producing uh, use values for the rest of humanity. In fact, the military is a socially per and a humanly pernicious institution. So it's beneficial to this country. Um, another aspect is very central is uh, respecting the national sovereignty of other countries, right? Which doesn't mean... Uh, cheering for whoever's leading other countries. That's a very distinct political act and the political act I'm talking about. The political act I'm talking about is that if a country decides to carry out a radical agrarian reform, the US should not be involved in disciplining that country, whether through uh, unilateral coercive actions um, in the financial or trading spheres or through militaristic actions. It should, there should not be a discipline against countries for carrying out a radical agrarian reform. And a radical agrarian reform is the most important thing any country can do to develop and is also necessary for this form of ecologically sensitive conversion of national uh, farming systems, right? That's another aspect. Um, uh, another aspect of it is decolonization, right? So this actually means actually saying, okay, what are the movements for domestic decolonization? Decolonization also in places like South Africa, where there's still a colonial linked land issue. Decolonization in places like Palestine, where the issue is also linked. Decolonization also in the United States and Canada. The shape of these struggles for decolonization is yet to be clear, of course. It is uh, yet to be fully determined, but it's very important that these struggles for decolonization also achieve their uh, support um, for uh, in, in order that the, these countries achieve uh, self-determination um, for their peoples. There are also um, uh, some other aspects of the kind of international question that I think are extremely important. Uh, one of them uh, is the, the question of climate debt. And this is something that I think is not as present in the international discussions as it should be. Now, this question of climate debt. Uh, if you go back to 2009, 2010, there was actually a world climate justice movement uh, that had a massive meeting in Cochabamba, Bolivia, in response to the failure of the Copenhagen Climate Summit to actually achieve climate justice on the part of, um, uh, to achieve climate justice for uh, the entire world and actually to achieve any meaningful results. Now, what uh, what, what did that mean, right? Now, what they basically said is that if we, uh, probably most people um, reject the legitimacy of the colonial enterprise, that is the illegitimate grasping of lands, resources, political rights of other countries. I mean, this is what the worldwide wave of decolonization was fundamentally about. They extended that principle to say, okay, there was also a process of colonization of the atmosphere. There was actual a grabbing of the atmospheric commons, which of course was the common ownership or right or property of humanity that was actually enclosed and used without collective permission by only a very small subset of humanity that is the industrialized North. That not only occurred, that also incurred a certain set of damages, right? That incurred uh, ongoing immediate effect, uh, global warming that is already harming the countries of the South. Uh, there's a book, Climate of Injustice, that put together a great deal of statistics to show how global warming is already severely damaging uh, Africa and South Asia. Um, and it also created, uh, so that's, um, it, it created a climate debt, that is the debt for the illegitimate use of atmospheric space. It incurred uh, mitigation debt, that is uh, to mitigate the damages that are occurring today. Then an adaptation debt, the cost of shifting um, and adapting to an ongoing damages of the climate. So what did they demand at uh, Cochabamba? They demanded 6% of Northern uh, gross national product per year for an indefinite period, um, that is Japan, Europe, uh, and the US to flow to the South. So the calculation would be about 1.3 trillion from the US, 3.2 trillion 
uh, from uh, the North as a whole. Now that sounds like a boggling amount of money, right? Why, why is that not a boggling amount of money? Because the US currently spends a trillion dollars a year on its military. So the idea, and this is what they said explicitly, is that the US could easily redirect this trillion dollars of surplus towards actually healing people instead of damaging people's lives, right? And this actually needs to be a foundation stone of a conversion to a, a peacetime economy. And so that is actually pretty much how I finished my book. And it's also how I'm going to uh, finish my presentation. Um, and I, I look forward to your questions.